Let's talk a little bit more about the way the world around us behaves. For example, imagine that we have two copper blocks, uh, each about this big, same size, same mass. Um, the only difference is one will be cold and one will be hot. One will be zero degrees Celsius, one will be 100 degrees Celsius. We put the two of them together right next to each other in good thermal contact. And you know what happens if we wait uh, long enough. The jewels that were in the 100 degree uh, C block, well, they start undergoing uh, a heat interaction with the um, block that is at zero degrees Celsius. And if you wait long enough, given their same size, same mass, both blocks will come to 50 degrees Celsius. Uh, there is a, a heat interaction in proportion to the heat capacity such that uh, joules move from one copper block over to the other. That's the way the world behaves. Now, how doesn't the way the world behave? Suppose we have those two copper blocks right next to each other, again in contact at 50 degrees Celsius. And suppose I tell you I come back an hour later and one of the blocks is now warmer, 100 degrees Celsius, and the other block is now colder, zero degrees Celsius, and I didn't have any kind of external agency, no type of action. I just say to you, that was spontaneous. Well, I did conserve jewels. I didn't create or destroy any jewels. So I'm okay on uh, kind of conservation of energy, um, internal energy, first law of thermodynamics. So something's missing that is not captured by that perspective. Um, and you say, well, yeah, that just doesn't happen. It's not the way the world works when two things of uh, unequal temperature in contact, while well, the warmer one gets colder and the colder one gets hot. That's just the way it works. So when two things are at the same temperature, they don't just spontaneously separate and diverge in temperature so that uh, one starts getting hot, one gets cold. It's not the way the world works. Well, you're right. We look around the world and that's not the way the world works. So we need something more. Um, there is kind of, if you will, uh, a directionality and an arrow of time. This is what's caught up in the second law of thermodynamics, um, that the direction of change, the way we observe it, uh, is, uh, is in, is in uh, one direction. Uh, hot things cool and then cool things get hot. It's not the other way around. Um, let's, take, uh, let's take coffee and milk. Um, if you start with some coffee and you pour in some milk and stir it around, you know, they get mixed up with each other. That just happens. Uh, it's spontaneous. That's the direction. No, long, no matter how long you leave that mixed uh, uh, coffee and milk together, it doesn't separate back to pure milk and pure coffee. Um, it just doesn't happen. That's not the way the world behaves. Um, energetically, that could be okay, but there's something about uh, a directionality of time, uh, a spontaneous direction that things happen. We need something more. Again, we need this second law of thermodynamics to help us explain the way the world behaves. Um, another example, we have a high, uh, we have a tank of uh, high pressure com compressed gas. Maybe at home, you've got a CO2 infuser to make your own sparkling water, um, or maybe uh, you've got uh, access to a nitrogen tank to blow up some balloons. Um, but we know that if you open up that valve, um, the high pressure gas goes out in the atmosphere, it just happens that way. Um, uh, if you, you, no matter how long you wait, um, those temperatures are equalizing. High pressure wants to go to low pressure, and then consequence, low pressure starts to increase to meet the high pressure. And at some point, you have an equalized normal pressure. No matter how long you wait, you're not just going to have an equalized normal pressure that suddenly uh, um, uh, the, uh, 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 the gas accumulates again in the cylinder all on its own um, and leaves a vacuum outside or a lower pressure. That's not the direction that things work. So we need something more, and that's the second law of uh, thermodynamics that talks about the spontaneity of the direction of change. Um, and that, the way we've discussed it so far, is, is qualitative. Um, if we want to uh, quantify it, um, that's where we're going to introduce the mathematics uh, that we'll call entropy. We're going to introduce a quantity called entropy. It'll be given the symbol S. We'll get into that. Um, but that allows us to actually uh, quantify this this uh, idea of uh, non uh, of non spontaneity and spontaneity. How spontaneous was it? How non spontaneous was the was uh, a proposed change? We want to put a number on it, and that's going to be this symbol uh, S for entropy, which which we'll get into.
Okay, a critical concept to think about or introduce are what we're going to call reversible or irreversible pathways. As we go from an initial state to a final state, are we following what's called a reversible pathway or are we following what's called an irreversible pathway? Um, this uh, differentiation or this concept uh, can take a while uh, to get used to. So let me look at it from different perspectives. Um, a reversible pathway means as you are moving along the path, at any point you can stop and go backwards. So, for example, if we are raising a weight on a frictionless pulley, we can pull that weight up and we can interrupt it at any point and go backwards with no loss or degradation of uh, available uh, work. Let's contrast that with um, having something that is at high pressure, a gas, and then opening the valve and using that to push back the atmosphere. Well, that pressure comes rushing out, and at no point can you just stop it, that rushing out pressure, and just have it go backwards. We call that irreversible. What are some of the characteristics of trying to define between a reversible or an irreversible? Well, let's take some of these state variables, like temperature, pressure. If it is irreversible, you can't really sometimes say what they are along the path. So example, this strongly expanding gas from a cylinder into a low pressure region. Well, you have wave fronts of that gas coming out. Um, it's gonna have a lot of heterogeneity. You know, you can't really say what the pressure is during that time period because they're little pockets of gas. Some of it are probably what you might call more local concentrations of molecules per cubic meter, some at higher, some heterogeneity of pressure. You don't really have a pressure statistic that bolus of gas. It's just a bit uh, chaotic coming out. Um, similarly, if we have um, something at a uh, 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 high temperature um, that is transferring joules to something at a lower temperature, say 100 Celsius in contact with a, with a, with a 90 Celsius, um, during that heat transfer, you don't really know what the temperature is in the intermediate regime. Um, depending on the nature of the heat transfer, you might have uh, variabilities in joule transfer rates where the two materials are better connected and uh, where they're not as well connected. Thinking about uh, two things that are pressed together, um, there are, uh, you don't really know what the temperature is across that temperature jump. So again, that's another characteristic of, of, of irreversible. Um, uh, in point of fact, reversible processes um, anytime you have a, a real process, a reversible process, um, well, if you don't want to have any friction, then it's going to take you forever, infinite amount of time. So a reversible process is uh, also um, uh, something that typically takes infinite amount of time uh, to take place. Uh, if you're going to be pushing back a cylinder, doing some kind of pressure volume work, pushing back a cylinder, if you want to avoid friction, you, and you want to know what the pressure is at every point, and you want to know what the volume is at every point, well, you have to do that infinitely slowly um, in order to get a reversible process. So you might say, well, okay, uh, no real processes are reversible processes, so why do we even talk about them? Well, and actually in thermodynamics, uh, we often always talk about reversible processes. Um, and why is that? Well, because they're a limit. They are uh, represent a limiting behavior um, say to efficiency of conversion uh, to some energy source over to some desirable, uh, uh, useful action. The thermodynamics represents an upper limit. The real world will be less efficient. Um, I could go along. I could go along with a whole list of examples that way. But the um, reversible process, um, the one that that is uh, uh, theoretical, the limiting process, often would take an infinite amount of time to actually do. Um, those are the best you can do and uh, the limit. And we'll see in our definition when we get to it of entropy that thinking about the reversible pathway from an initial state 
to a final state, um, that is a, a, a key thing that we're going to need uh, to do. We're going to need to connect an initial state and a final state by reversible, even if theoretical, by a reversible pathway in order to get at this quantity of, uh, of entropy change. And that then would be uh, um, the entropy change from the initial state and the final state. Um, and even if it is an, uh, the real pathway is an irreversible pathway, like a rapid expansion or something like that, the actual entropy change, uh, entropy turns out to be a state variable, meaning it's independent of the pathway. So even though in the real world you follow an irreversible pathway, um, you can calculate the entropy change following a reversible pathway. Again, this is a, a subtle concept that will come with practice, um, but to talk about entropy, um, we need to talk about reversible, which we just did. Okay, let's give the equation. What is entropy? Entropy is given the symbol S as you move along a reversible pathway from an initial state to a final state. Um, because it's reversible, you can do it in incremental steps. You can always stop and reverse it. Well, at any incremental step, the entropy is defined, defined as ds uh, equals the reversible heat interaction divided by temperature across that infinitesimal step. Um, what I also want to say is that that definition is not unique. That we won't get into it, but just so you think that, just so you know that uh, entropy is not something uh, uh, mystical or magical. It is simply a mathematical artifice that quantifies um, the um, change uh, in reversible heat interaction. Um, divided by temperature across a pathway from initial to final state. And it's not unique. We could have used um, other math, and other math has been uh, defined over the years, but it turns out, as we'll show for example, that kind of a, a minimalist or simplest math to use is the definition that I just gave, and it's the one then that is actually used uh, most uh, widely. Um, but whether you use that one or another definition of entropy, all of that math is oriented. You have to be self-consistent in the way you treat the universe. You have to define a, a mathematical function, entropy. I gave you one, but there are actually an infinite number you can define um, if you get into advanced thermodynamics. And I only say that to again emphasize that entropy is not a, a physical quantity. Entropy is a state variable, which is great. And it's a state variable that allows us to quantify um, what we know about the uh, direction of time or the, or the way that things work, that things next to each other, uh, one cools, one warms, uh, not that two things at the same temperature spontaneously separate temperatures um, to one being warm and one being cool. So entropy is simply a mathematical function that's going to allow us to track that and quantify it and keep track of it, almost like an accountant keeps track of it. Um, entropy is not something we can... Uh, uh, a measure, um, but it is something we can keep track of. And it's very uh, uh, powerful. So at the end of the day, we're going to say that the total entropy of the universe uh, must be equal to or greater than zero, must change. The change in total entropy of the universe must be equal to or greater than zero for any process we consider. So to unpack that a little bit, if the total change in the entropy of the universe is zero, it's a reversible process. If the total change in entropy of the universe is greater than zero, then it is uh, um, uh, an irreversible process. And I said there, total entropy. This is quite important because most of the other things we've spoken about, we've really just focused on the system. Temperature, temperature of the system. Pressure, pressure of the system. Volume, volume of the system. Internal energy, internal energy of the system. Kinetic energy, kinetic energy of the system. We've often been able to ignore the surroundings. Well, when we talk about uh, 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 entropy, um, you always have to be very careful because sometimes we could be talking about entropy of the surroundings. Sometimes we could be talking about entropy of the system. Sometimes we could be talking about the two of those being added together, which is the, the total entropy. Um, and occasionally um, we'll get a little sloppy and we'll leave, say, the system subscript off of entropy. And so you might think it's the total entropy, but in that case, maybe it's only the system entropy. So you always have to be careful about these contextual tools. And unlike uh, most of the other variables in thermodynamics, entropy stands out 
uh, as a, a particularly vexing one, just in terms of labeling, and that we should really always keep track of uh, S surroundings, S system, and S total, but we can get sloppy about that. Um, and even if I'm perfect about it, which I won't be, other authors and other places you encounter it will be sloppy. So when you see that S, always ask yourself, am I talking about entropy of system? Am I talking about total entropy, S system plus S surroundings? What am I talking about? It's going to be important to always keep that in mind for the math and the messages to stay clear. Okay, let's next advance on the concept of entropy or the use of entropy by using a specific famous example. Let's have two compartments in contact. They're divided by a removable slider. Uh, one has a, a high pressure gas in it and the other side has vacuum. So when we remove the high pressure slider, we know right away that the high pressure gas goes to the low pressure side. We know that's spontaneous. Let's calculate now the entropy change associated with that. We're going to say that these two boxes together are isolated from the environment, so no energy or work or uh, mass exchange with the surroundings. Uh, so right away that means no work interaction, no heat interaction. This gas expands into the uh, uh, other chamber. Those two chambers will be uh, the same uh, size and it will be an ideal gas. What we'll see is that although that is an irreversible process, uh, meaning that the change in the entropy of system is uh, positive, and especially because we're isolated from the surroundings, the change in entropy of the surroundings is zero. So we add those two together and the change of the entropy of the universe is positive. Our change in entropy total is positive. Uh, that's good. That's, uh, that's our use of the second law. I mean, it's spontaneous. So although that's irreversible, and actually to calculate the actual value of the change in entropy, we will follow a reversible pathway that gets to the same destination. And we'll use that reversible pathway then to calculate the change in entropy. Since entropy is a state function, if we get to it following a reversible pathway, the same final state, the same pressure, volume, temperature, uh, if we get to that same final state following a reversible pathway, then we can say that change in entropy that we can calculate on the reversible pathway is the same change in entropy that happened on the irreversible expansion or the irreversible pathway uh, that, uh, uh, that, that took place. So let's dive into that now as an example. Okay, so to, to dive into this, let's imagine if we have a chamber. Okay, we have a chamber, and in that chamber, we're going to have 10 to the 5 pascals of what? Of an ideal gas. And it's going to be next to another chamber. This other chamber in the initial state will have no gas in it, so it'll be vacuum. We'll just put zero pascals, and they are separated by a divider. Um, and these two chambers together are uh, highly insulated from the surroundings so that no heat interaction can take place. And the two boxes are rigid borders, so no work interactions taking place. Um, so if this is the uh, initial state, and then what we do is we remove this divider. So now the two boxes are uh, connected. And when the two boxes are connected, we have one uh, larger box. Okay, so now we have one larger box. Um, and we, uh, if the uh, two boxes were originally of the same uh, volume, um, then the final volume is twice that. This will be our final state. This whole thing, of course, is still completely isolated. Now we can ask, given that we had kind of two systems, we had kind of system one, which was a box over here, and system two, which was a box over here, and then we had the surroundings. Well, okay, so... The system and the surroundings, we can see, since it was totally isolated, um, when we went from initial to final, there was no heat interaction because it's totally insulated. There was no work interaction between the system and the surroundings, so that's okay. Um, between uh, the two systems, when we removed that partition, we also weren't pushing against anything. We also weren't having any heat interactions. So uh, when we're done then, we can ask, 
what's going on over here in the final box uh, with regard to pressure, volume, and temperature? Well, for an ideal gas, we have a couple of things about the ideal gas. One, we have its equation of state, which is PV equals nRT. The other thing about an ideal gas is that um, its molecules don't have any interactions, and so the relationship between its internal energy and its uh, change in temperature is a constant relation, meaning that the internal energy of the gas only depends on uh, temperature, that heat capacity has no dependence on the density of the gas because it's an ideal gas, it's a property, a part of the definition of an ideal gas. So if we look at that, we can then say, well, okay, what was the change in energy? Um, well, the change in energy should be Q plus W, which is zero. And the change in energy, well, we have no kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy. The only thing we have is uh, possible internal energy. So the change in internal energy must also be zero. Um, and since the change in internal energy is zero, then the change in temperature is zero for this ideal gas. And since the change in temperature is zero, then this term in the equation of state is a constant. So pressure times volume is a constant. So that means that if the volume uh, went up, because uh, I, I said I had two initial boxes of the same volume, if the volume uh, doubles, then the new pressure, since PV equals a constant, the new pressure must be half of the initial pressure. So that is the expansion of an ideal gas into vacuum, no change in temperature, um, and the pressure uh, goes in half. Well, uh, again, we know that must be irreversible. It must be irreversible because uh, that gas will never spontaneously separate back into a region that's at high pressure and low pressure. So we know from common experience this must be irreversible process. Uh, irreversible process or an irreversible pathway was followed. So then the question emerges, the one, the question we really want to answer then for all of this is uh, delta S, the change in entropy, is what? Delta U was zero, delta T was zero, but the process was irreversible. And to be specific, in this case, delta S, well, we're delta S, just to be specific, is delta S of the system, right? Delta S of the system. We know delta S of surroundings must be zero since it was an isolated, no interaction. So we, we look for delta S of system in this case. We're also asking what's delta S total. So how do we answer that? Well, uh, we're going to go to the next slide. To answer that, to get the delta S quantity, we have to do the same process, meaning we should end up with delta T of zero, a pressure of one half. We want to get to that same destination, starting at the initial state, going to the final state. We want to get to that same destination of delta T equals zero and pressure equals half of 10 to the 5 PA for doubling in volume. We get to that same destination following a reversible pathway. And then we'll be able to calculate delta S of system by using along that reversible pathway, uh, we'll be able we'll be able to use along that reversible pathway, we'll be able to use our definition of DS of the system equals heat interactions reversible over T, we'll be able to do that um, and calculate the S. And because S is a state function, we will then know what the delta S was by getting that same destination by an irreversible process. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so our goal here is to go from this initial pressure uh, which we'll call uh, P initial, which was 10 to the 5 pascals, and this initial volume, uh, which we'll uh, 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 call 1 uh, cubic meter, and this initial temperature, which we'll call 298 Kelvin, so 10 to the 5 pascals, 1 cubic meter, and 298 Kelvin. That's going to be our initial state. And 
we did this irreversibly. We got to something that was twice the volume. So P final, V final, and T final. We know that that's twice the volume, and the P final is one half the initial value, 10 to the 5 pascals. The V final was twice uh, 2 cubic meters. Um, the two, 1 to 2 was doubling of the volume, and the temperature didn't change. Now, uh, we did that irreversibly, and we're trying to find out now what is uh, uh, the delta S of the system for that process to get into our uh, final state. So graphically, we start with a, a pressure volume and our working fluid, so to speak, the gas, the working fluid, which is a technical term, the working fluid, the material, was the ideal gas, and that's the equation of state for the working fluid of the ideal gas. So if we start at some pressure and volume, and we're moving to a final pressure and volume, where the volume uh, uh, doubled, well, based on the equation of state, PV equals nRT, if we stand at constant T, that would be PV equals a constant. So we can draw isotherms, isotherms meaning constant temperature lines. That's where uh, PV equals a constant, or uh, meaning that uh, T is a constant, meaning that delta T uh, along those lines are a constant. Okay, so if we consider then the initial state here, we should stay on that line as we try to move to our final state. So if we're doubling the volume, we should be moving approximately this way, okay, approximately that way. That was our initial and final state. So how can we think about doing that in a reversible fashion? Well, we could choose first to allow no heat interaction, just to get ourselves to the right volume. So no heat interaction is what we'd call an adiabat, um, an adiabatic change. So if you go down here kind of in step one, if we could do that reversibly, expanding the gas, but not allowing any heat interaction with the surroundings. If we do that in step one, then in step two, we could stay at the same volume and have a heat interaction, apply fire, okay? So we're going to do this in step one, step two. We're going to do that on the next slide. And I drew those as solid lines just to indicate they're actually following a reversible process, whereas these kind of pointy blue lines just means we changed, but we didn't really have pressure and volume controlled. We didn't really know what they were. It was just a rapid expansion. So certain pockets of the gas uh, we're probably higher pressure, so we're probably ho lower pressure. We can't define a pressure statistic. So somehow we just jump from initial to final for the irreversible process. Whereas for the reversible process, we're able to follow these smoothly changing lines. And we're going to do it in two steps. And we're going to calculate uh, for then the overall change, delta S of system, initial to final, is going to be the delta S of the system for the first step, which we'll do irreversibly plus delta S of the system for the second step, which we'll do irreversibly. And then whatever we calculate there for the reversible steps must then also be the same value as for the irreversible pathway, for which we couldn't do the direct calculation, but S is a state variable, so we're okay to do it by a different pathway as long as we get to the same final state of pressure, temperature, volume um, for the combined reversible pathway compared to the irreversible pathway. So let's dive into that. So in the first step, we want to move on a well-defined path one, and that well-defined uh, path one, which uh, proceeds as follows, so is going to be doubling the volume under the constraint of an adiabat. Um, so if we are doubling the volume under the constraint of an adiabat in step one, where an adiabat, when we say that word, that means that um, the heat interaction, 
Uh, in this case, the reversible heat interaction is zero. Okay, so I'm going to move pressure and volume while having no heat interaction. Well, when we're all done then, by definition, I want to double the volume. I don't quite yet know the pressure. I could calculate it, but I haven't yet done that for you. I don't quite yet know the temperature. I could calculate that, but I haven't done it for you. But uh, we do know that PV and RT, when we doubled the volume, uh, that equation of state must still be followed, even though I haven't quite given you the pressure and uh, temperature. But more importantly, given the definition of uh, DS of the system, and given that it's the adiabat, um, well, we've just said on the adiabat that this is zero. So if we then integrate across, uh, across the whole business to get the change in the entropy of the system in step one, well, that's just got to be uh, zero. So we have figured out that for going along the adiabat from uh, uh, along this green line, that for this part, number one, delta S of one for the system is zero because we're following um, the definition of the adiabat of no heat interactions. Now, as we move along that adiabat, and we want to know what the, those final temperatures and pressures are. Well, we're going to have that the delta change in energy of the system. In this case, the only term there is its internal energy, no kinetic energy and so on and uh, uh, so forth. Um, if we do that on a differential uh, basis, then we should have that the change in internal energy is a CV times DT since it's a ideal gas. We want to do it on a molar basis. We can put in the number of moles and use a little CV uh, instead of a big CV where that's the heat capacity per mole. And that energy change should be balanced by whatever uh, heat interaction and work interaction we have. Well, we said by definition we're on this adiabat. So the only thing we have left is a work interaction. And if that is, we're expanding, we're doing pressure against uh, um, a volume, so the uh, work term is just negative P uh, dV, that's the force acting through the distance and the system loses energy and negative as it, as it pushes against uh, a pressure. So we also have the ideal gas law, which we can substitute in for uh, uh, pressure, PV equals nRT, so that gives us negative P, I'm sorry, that gives us uh, uh, PV equals nRT. That gives us uh, P negative nRT divided through by V dV. So uh, we've uh, managed to equate this with that. And so if we rearrange that, well, the N's cancel. So we, we get NCV dT equals negative nRT V over dV. The N's cancel. We rearrange uh, the terms so we can write dt over t equals uh, negative r gas constant over cv dv over v. And then we can then integrate that from our initial temperature, which we knew, 298 Kelvin, our final temperature, which is what we're trying to find out, our initial volume, which we uh, no, it was one cubic meter, and we doubled it. Our final volume, two cubic meters. That was part of the description. Um, and so if we integrate those, uh, we end up with the uh, relationship where we can now find the final temperature, um, T uh, F T final over T initial is V final over V initial raised to the negative R C, V. Okay, now we could uh, do that out, um, but the important point here now is we've got TF in terms of things we know about, the initial temperature, the final, the initial volume, and the final uh, volume.
and then uh, CV for our ideal gas and negative R. So TF now is a defined quantity when you get to the end of that adiabat, doubling the volume. Put another way, we now know delta T as well, if we wanted to, um, delta T, what the temperature change uh, was. Again, I'm not calculating this with real numbers. You could just substitute in the initial one cubic meter, the final two cubic meters, T initial 298, um, uh, uh, Kelvin, gas constant, and the uh, uh, heat capacity. Uh, but we can also get the delta T from the start to the finish um, along an adiabat that's constrained to that doubling of the volume. Okay, just as a specific example, following up on that equation, if we want to know T final, well, that would be T initial V final over V initial gas constant over uh, the um, a heat capacity. Now, the heat capacity varies depending on what type of ideal gas that we have. For uh, the very simple ones, the monatomics, helium and uh, uh, neon and so on and so forth, um, the heat capacity turns out to be 3 halves R. So that's sufficient information. So if we start with 298, our V final was 2 cubic meters, our V initial was 1 cubic meters, negative R divided by uh, 3 halves R, um, well, that's negative two-thirds R, and then so if we, uh, I'm sorry, the R cancels out, that's negative two-thirds. So if we then uh, evaluate that for its final uh, value, then we get 187 Kelvin. So in that expansion, our adiabatic expansion from our initial point to our final point with no heat interactions but pushing, and doing work on the outside and therefore losing joules, we crossed from an isotherm of 298 Kelvin over to an isotherm of 187 Kelvin. And so our next step is gonna be to push ourselves back up uh, to our final point that we got by the uncontrolled expansion while holding volume uh, constant. So that'll be our next step, step two. Now, the next step, uh, we have gone from along one. So now the next step, we want to get from here to here in step uh, two. In step two. So the idea is that in step two, we can get to our target, which was the final state we got to in the case of the irreversible, which was uh, that we have now the uh, known uh, volume. Again, the volume has doubled to two. Um, the pressure, well, we know what that is now. It's, uh, it's one half. And then the uh, temperature should get back to its starting point, 298 Kelvin. So this transition to is being done at constant volume. Uh, dV equals uh, zero. We call that an isochore. So we want to know the change in entropy of the isochore. And we can see that we're staying at the same volume, but we're increasing uh, uh, temperature. So the governing uh, equation for this uh, would be as uh, follows. The incremental change in the system energy, again, is just the internal energy because there's no kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and so on. And we know that on... Uh, for the ideal gas on a molar basis, we've got N little c dV, the heat capacity, dT, um, and we further know um, that that should be uh, balanced against whatever uh, small amount of heat interaction there is and whatever small amount of work interaction there is. Now, because we're on the isochore, um, the PV work, well, there's no change in uh, volume. Um, dV equals zero, so there's no work, so it's all tied up in the, uh, the heat interaction. Okay, well, uh, as we're doing all of this uh, reversibly, we know that um, the change in entropy of the system is the heat interaction reversible over T. And we're doing all of this reversibly, so we can replace the heat interaction here with T ds uh, system. And now we can take this part of the equation, this part of the equation, uh, and we can connect them. So we get that uh, ncv dt equals t ds uh, system. 
we uh, rearrange, we get that uh, DS system equals NCV DT over T, which we can then uh, integrate. Uh, that leads to uh, the change in entropy of uh, the system is NCV from the initial temperature, which in this case is the initial uh, temperature uh, on segment two, to the final temperature on uh, segment uh, 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 two, um, dt over uh, t, which leads us to uh, the natural log uh, relationship NCV, natural log uh, t final over our t initial, where that's on segment uh, two. Okay, we're now getting very close uh, to being done. Uh, we, we, we obtained that the change of uh, the system in going from one uh, to two was just uh, NCV, natural log of T final of segment two over T initial of segment uh, two. Now we can just do some notation things here where T final of segment two, by our problem definition, the temperature didn't uh, change from the initial. So we have that's based on T initial of segment one is equal to T final of segment two. That was part of our problem setup. That was, uh, so to speak, a given. And then T initial of segment two, well, that's T final of segment one. That's based on the fact that we went from segment one and then to segment two. So what is the final for segment one is the initial for uh, segment uh, uh, two. Now, we also obtained the relationship of TI and TF for that segment uh, one, that relationship that we uh, obtained was that uh, TF over TI for segment uh, one was the volume final over the volume initial to the negative RCV. We obtained that a few minutes ago. So taking that result and substituting it in uh, up here, we get that delta S system from one to two is N C V um, V F over V I, and because we have to flip the uh, F and I relative to the I and F, um, the law of uh, uh, logarithms. Uh, let's see here. I just left out a natural log in here. The law of logarithms is that we swap this uh, negative sign with a positive uh, sign. So we get R, C, V. And then the next law of logarithms is that we can take an exponent out front, uh, in front of the logarithm. So that leaves us with uh, N, C, V, R, C, V. The CVs cancel. Natural log V final over V initial. Uh, and so our final answer for segment uh, two, delta S, is N R natural log V final over V initial. Okay, so now we're all set to uh, calculate the total change where the change in entropy of the system in step one was just uh, uh, zero. And uh, the units on that uh, for entropy are uh, joules per Kelvin. That's where we count it. We calculated the change in entropy of the system for uh, step uh, uh, two, which we got was uh, NR natural log uh, V final over V initial. So to get our total change in uh, entropy, well, that total change in entropy is delta S total uh, of the system. Delta S total of the system is, is delta S system one plus delta S system two 
Delta S system one is just zero. Delta S system two is N R natural log V F over V initial. So putting in real numbers, zero N R. Well, we have P V over T equals N R uh, from the uh, equation of state for the ideal gas. So P V over T natural log V final over V initial. Well, um, P V over T. Uh, that's an equation of state. We can choose it. The initial state, final state, taking the values of the initial state, it's 10 to the 5 pascals, 1 cubic meter. You multiply a pascal to cubic meter, you get a joule. Temperature was 298, and we said we were doubling the volume. And if you do that out uh, numerically, you get 232.6 joules per Kelvin as the change in the uh, uh, system entropy, so the system entropy increased. As an aside, since we did this whole thing reversibly, that means that the total entropy, system and surroundings, uh, system and surroundings, so total entropy of uh, the universe, system and surroundings, system and surroundings. Well, that total change, since it was done reversibly, must be zero, implying that if the system is positive 232.6, then the surroundings uh, are negative 232.6. So in this uh, uh, expansion done reversibly, um, we increase the entropy of the system by 232.6 and we decrease the entropy of the surroundings by negative 232.6 reversibly. Um, the irreversible one, we didn't actually interact with the surroundings. So we just did irreversibly, we just jumped from an initial to a final. Well, the system entropy is the same, positive 232.6. The entropy in the surroundings did not change at all in that case. So in that case, uh, if this was for the reversible case. In the case of the irreversible case, the entropy total change uh, is just going to be the entropy of the system, 232, and there's no offsetting change in the surroundings. So that's a key difference. The reversible case, the entropy of the universe did not change. The increase of the system entropy was exactly offset by the decrease of the surroundings entropy. In the irreversible case, just the system entropy increased. So we see this quantity S is interesting compared to some of our other quantities in that it's not a conserved quantity. Uh, you, you can make more of it. Um, the, the, the sum of the in the universe can't go down. You can make more of it. In a reversible case, it is conserved. Delta S of the universe is zero. But when you have irreversible processes, delta S of the universe goes up. And at the same time, you calculate the system increase by identifying a reversible pathway and uh, evaluating the reversible heat interaction divided by temperature all along that reversible pathway. And that's how we came up with 232.6 as the change in the system entropy, whether it was done reversibly or irreversibly, the change in the uh, uh, surroundings entropy was zero in the case of it being done irreversibly and minus 232.6 in the case of it being done reversibly. So in review, in, in today's uh, discussion, we did two things. The first thing we did was we talked about qualitatively how there are changes in the world as we look about and that seem to have a direction of time or a natural direction. A hot block next to a cold block, uh, one cools, the other warms, they come to the same temperature. If you have two blocks at the same temperature, you never observe that one warms and one cools, although that, can, that uh, conserves joules and would be fine by the first law, there's still something missing. And so we needed this idea of, of spontaneity. The second law comes into it, and we developed that there's some mathematics. We defined a function s, and we said ds is 
defined as the uh, reversible uh, heat interaction, DSS system defined as the reversible heat interaction divided by temperature, we can calculate the change along a reversible pathway and delta S of the system plus delta S of the surrounding, which together or delta S total, that's equal to zero if we followed a reversible pathway. It's greater than zero and spontaneous if we followed an irreversible pathway. And it's never observed in the history of human experience that delta S total is negative for any process. We should emphasize that spontaneous also does not mean fast, it just means it can happen. Maybe it happens like that, Maybe the actual process is slow and maybe it takes a million years or a billion years. So spontaneous doesn't imply the time scale of the change. Spontaneous only implies that it can happen. Whereas non-spontaneous delta S total less than zero implies that it can never happen. So we introduce this uh, concept S, which is not something you measure. Um, uh, it's something that's defined by us. Um, we could define other functions of S. In fact, they're an infinite number. If you get into that in this advanced topic, an infinite number of functions that serve the same purpose as quantifying the change. The simplest one is reversible uh, heat interaction divided by temperature. Um, the important thing is if you, whatever definition you uh, assume, you use it consistently when you describe the entire universe. So that's the simplest one. That's the widespread one. Um, uh, uh, I only emphasize that there are an infinite number of functions that you could choose uh, without going into the details of that to indicate that entropy is really an accounting. It's not something we measure. It's an artifice. It's something uh, mathematical that's very useful for quantifying the extent of, uh, of, of spontaneous, irreversible uh, uh, change because if we add up a couple processes, there must sum up to being, the change in entropy must sum up to being zero or positive in order for the overall complex process uh, to ever be possible, to be spontaneous. Acabou.